John Sebastian returns to the Paul Leslie Hour. What a day for a daydream, just like on this episode. After more than 10 years, we present the return of singer-songwriter and founding member of the Love and Spoonful, John Sebastian. Enjoy the show. <laughs> I'm listening. Paul? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to properly introduce the guest we have today. This is the return of John Sebastian. He is a guitarist, a singer, harmonica player, a songwriter. In fact, he's an inductee in the Songwriters Hall of Fame. He's one of the best performers and entertainers I've had the chance to see. And he's got this new album out. You can look this up, and I, I highly suggest you get a copy John Sebastian and Arlen Roth explore the Spoonfill songback songbook. <laughs> I was thinking of Welcome Back all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said it. Yes, indeed. Yeah, we didn't get around to Welcome Back, so it leaves us something to do for the next project. So tell me, you you went back and recorded all of these really, really great songs that have just endured their their timeless songs what did it feel like to revisit all this material well you know part of it was i was really scared of this idea Hmm. uh, because one thing that i was very anxious about just in general was not to do that thing that i'd seen happen to many artists who would have a uh, a, a visible single or or something like that, and then kind of have to repeat it several times to m- maintain the career or whatever. So I guess uh, because I was busy with jug band music and nonsense like that, I didn't get around to it. Or I may I might say that I was consciously trying to avoid that kind of thing. But after seeing, well, first of all, I heard several of Arlen's album projects, which were often things like acoustic Rolling Stones and uh, the uh, instrumental Simon and Garfunkel. He played with both guys. He could, he knew all the parts, so he could make a great project there. And Catherine and I, my wife and I, were uh, several times sitting around listening to these albums. And I always had the same reaction, which is, you know, this could be so lousy. And it's so not. It's just such a nice mood to this project. And uh, so the next time that Arlen and I crossed paths, because we have a lot of common friends and we also uh, play together kind of at the last minute fairly often. Uh, I I mentioned the, the, the thing about how cool the projects were. And he said, so you've never done that with the spoonful. <laughs> I said, no, I, I've been afraid, completely afraid of it. And he goes, yeah, but we'd have half of the arrangements licked. <laughs> and and I, it was at that point that I had to go, you know, if it was Arlen and I, said, this could be good. I had this experience. See, part of it is that my whole lifetime with Zalman Yanovsky was not dissimilar to this idea, mm. which is John you play the foundation, no fancy stuff, no fads. And we're going to leave all the, uh, the, you know, the, the cool swan dives and everything to uh, Zalman, or in this case, Arlen. And uh, we started playing quite casually after that suggestion and it was remarkable how fast uh, it it became a, uh, a, a, a it it began to excite me is what it was that it went from gee could we do this or would it be stupid 
uh, to, gee, this is real fun. And uh, so that, that was how the, uh, the exploring started. On the note of Arlen Roth, you've done quite a lot of collaborating with a lot of different great musicians, Dave Grisman before. How important is it that you like the guy that you're working with? You know, that's an interesting question, uh, because I have worked with both types, uh, <laughs> guys that I really adored and and guys that I, I can't say that I worked with anybody that I disliked, but maybe just was kind of neutral about. And sure, I'd be glad to play a session. Sure. But Arlen, he's such a great guy. So Arlen, you know, Arlen and I get along. And look, Arlen can be difficult, just like Yanofsky could be difficult. Uh, I found myself feeling comfort level when he was being difficult. That's the weird thing about, you know, probably it's the relationship between Yanofsky and I being being mirrored now. And, and in fact, Arlen is a lot more sensible and and if we got down to technique he's he's certainly a a more advanced instrumentalist uh but the thing that made the project so fun was that he had taken in zalman yanovsky's uh attitude and and uh preferences very very seriously and that that also made for little things where we'd be trying out a tune and he'd play a little lick and I'd go, where is that from? And he'd go, come on, John, that's Zalman played that in the second verse. Uh, and uh, so I just switched it around to another place. So that was frequently what was going on for, for Arlen was that, that uh, he was using Yanovsky's uh, uh, I don't know what you could what you could call it. Uh, Yanovsky's inspiration, which very often was combining blues and country music, and uh, uh, you know, uh, like country pianists. Last date, uh, you know, I, I'm mm. thinking of uh, Floyd Kramer. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yes. So, thinking about uh, folks like Floyd Kramer, who he had a tremendous admiration for, and in fact was doing a lot of techniques involving hammering on that simulated the piano's lack of a moving tone. It's interesting that you brought up country music. There have been a lot of country music songwriters on this show who, when they're listing their influences, who were your writing influences? The name John Sebastian comes up quite a lot. And isn't it true that you all played the Grand Ole Opry recently? Yes, Arlen and I just did that. Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. Because, you know, the playing and the being on stage and everything that was marvelous. We hadn't done that in a really long time, but every second of the show, I knew what it meant to Arlen and Arlen knew what it meant to me because, you know, I'm really delighted that so many uh, uh, songwriters uh, uh, mentioned me in that context, uh, but it isn't something that I assumed uh, hmm. in my life, you know, I, I guess I thought, you know, we're up here, we're back East, we're doing this thing and, uh, they're doing that thing down there. And only way to be part of it is to go there and get in it. Uh, and that was only partially true. It turned out. Hmm. Well, the one thing about a lot of the songs you've written and the, the stuff that you've recorded is, it is all over the place. The people who are watching the video version of this, they can see some of the pictures behind you. I had Jimmy Vivino on the show and he did an impersonation of you talking. 
And he, he was talking about your admiration for the great people throughout all the different genres of music that are a part of this American music. And you have a real admiration for the people of yesteryear. Yes, I do. Uh, and I think that part of it came about because uh, of that moment in Greenwich Village when so many of us were first taking in some of these great musicians that had, you know, just hadn't gotten around to being available in cities. Uh, you know, it just was a, a, a completely new and magical thing. And then when you'd go and find the guy that you were searching out and you hear him and you go, man, it's even more amazing than I ever thought, you know, Things like, uh, in fact, Jimmy uh, and I, Jimmy Vivino and I uh, had frequent occasions where we'd be playing with Hubert Sumlin. And the two of us would go, okay, now, tonight, you're going to watch his right hand. I'm going to watch his left hand. And we're going to have a meeting after the show, and we're going to talk about what we learned. Do the whole show. We go backstage. Go sit down in the green room. Okay. What'd you figure out? I got nothing. I didn't figure out anything. And that was how it was so frequently was that this, this magic didn't, it didn't even dissipate when you were right there watching it. It was like a, a real skilled uh, card man, you know, uh, just real remarkable stuff. You know, I don't know, Johnny. I don't know if anybody's ever going to be able to be that guy. <laughs> when I mention people that you've been in awe to be around, who are the first few people? Just who? Just randomly, who comes to mind? Okay, Buddy Holly, because I just wanted to learn that'll be the day. It took me years to find out that that was a Lightning Hopkins lick. Uh, uh, Mississippi John Hurt because of this en enchanting thumb picking Piedmont style not Mississippi style that he had uh, in his in his uh, in his suitcase whatever you'd call it uh, that, uh, that was really really important to me uh, and then having this it was a, a, an incredible thing that happened to me and jimmy together when we finally got together and had an opportunity to do something together and we immediately wanted to do a jug band so we're we got all through this album uh, up here in woodstock when we get a call from a friend who says uh yeah you know i'm up here in indianapolis and uh uh, boy, it was great to hear you guys because she she's a occasional Woodstocker. Said uh, Becky Brindle, by the way, is is who I'm talking about. A really good guitarist who said uh, to me, "Oh yeah, man, that was great to hear you guys play." Uh, and you know, it was great to hear the mandolin in in, in the blues setting. And I, I said, "Yeah, well, you know." Yeah, it, it wasn't Yank Racial, but it was, we were doing our best. And she goes, oh, Yank Racial, you know, he taught me so much guitar. And me and Jimmy are kind of looking at each other because we're on the other end of the phone. And we, we can't figure out how this could be. Because what he's talking about is playing with Sleepy John Estes. And we know that period, and he's got to be dead. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> but what we learn is that uh, those guys, uh, they, they went and pulled Yank out of his house when he was still like 12 or 13 because he was already this kind of uh, genius stylist uh, that... Uh, so so remarkable so we go to indianapolis because the other thing that she says is oh yeah i said does he still play i mean what is he 80 what 
She goes, still play? He comes down and he plugs into this twin and plays with my psychedelic blues band here in <laughs> Indianapolis. So at that point, now we, we, then now we call Yank and we say uh, that we're enchanted with his style and we're just and so on and blah, 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 blah. We're all nervous. And so we finally stop talking and you can hear Yank kind of lean into the phone and go, well, you tell me where to come. Hmm. And that was like a challenge. It was, I mean, I drafted, I grabbed Fritz Richmond, our wonderful tub and jug player and, and uh, Paul Rochelle and Annie Rains. And we went to Indianapolis and we had three wonderful days of recording with Yank. I'm still friends with their family. Hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, going back to this, this recent album where you're revisiting the Spoonful songbook. Yes. There are some really, really cool excursions that you make, uh, or not excursions. I don't know what you'd call it, but diversions. Like, for example, I was listening to Daydream, and there's no singing in it, but it's, <laughs> it's so cool. I love it. Oh, I'm really glad. That's great. What made you decide to go that direction? Well, we had started with the premise that we were going to make an instrumental Love and Spoonful album. Mm. And that was the idea. And we made considerable progress, just the two of us. And I don't know if you have a physical copy of the, of the project, but uh, I uh, took two pictures of me and Arlen and ripped them in half and put them together as a way of saying that we were kind of forced into a different format than playing just the two of us. Well, we began to miss a good bassist and a good drummer here and there. So that became a thing. And we were all finished with all of those things when COVID hit and we suddenly couldn't be in the room together. And this was really early on. So nobody knew what was mm -hmm. available and what wasn't. So uh, it, uh, it suddenly turned into another thing that we were very familiar with, which was uh, Joe Schmo sends you a, uh, a, a track and, uh, you know, put something on there and send it back. Well, each of us were, you know, we've both made our bones as multi-instrumentalists, not just guitarists or harmonica players. So that second round was the round where we could say, well, we don't, this one without a vocal is sort of missing. So maybe I can draft Maria Muldor to sing with me for stories we could tell. Or maybe I could call in uh, a, uh, I, I, this is hard to uh, start at the beginning of, but about four years ago, I, uh, was sent uh, an email of two young women uh, doing daydream <laughs> with a ukulele and a guitar. And it was charming and it was wonderful. And I wrote back to the guy saying, you know, this, you can't have, this is sibling harmony. I don't know what the story is on these girls, but this is sibling harmony. You can't have it without Phil and Don or, you know, whatever. You, you really need that combination. And uh, a couple weeks later, I get an email from the women that had made the project. Oh, yes, we did that when we were a little younger. And I now I'm getting the picture. These are uh, two young Austrian women whose father just happens to be the most important uh, producer in Vienna, 
and uh, uh, he makes projects all you know summer and winter. Here comes a jazz band, records them. Here comes a rock band, records them, and so he's got all of this experience. It's like thirty years. Meanwhile, his daughters are growing up, and he discovers that when he comes in in the morning to go to work, the faders are in a different place. So he, he realizes that they're sneaking in and recording at night. <laughs> now, what kind of a dad doesn't tell? He doesn't say a word. He just lets it go on. And so then as they develop, then he began to actually produce them a little bit. And uh, their, their projects... I kept getting sent, okay, could you put a harmonica on this? Well, sure. Well, I really put some effort into the harmonica part, and I got this huge 15-inch speaker, big rig for, you know, this little instrument so that it would sound, uh, like, comically huge. And uh, that went over great. They called me for another similar project. And then they called me for what was their first album that they'd written because they were fabulous Beatles simulators. Uh, they, they had a, a whole life uh, at the, uh, at the Beatles first joint there, the cavern. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, when the cavern got rebuilt, they went to work there. So they're getting all this experience of live performance. And it isn't cute, by the way. That club is nasty. Uh, it's populated by, like, drunken teenagers. You know, and I just think, you know, these two beautiful girls are standing up there every night and just taking whatever comes and, and singing Beatles tunes. So they're, they're a remarkable, uh, they're a remarkable duo. And the next thing was they called me, said, you know, we are having trouble uh, figuring how to do the video for this song because we think uh, you, you should be in it. <laughs> so would you come to Manchester <laughs> and be in our video? So after explaining to them that they were going to get me divorced, I, said, I went to gather <laughs> and I said, okay, honey. All right. So two Austrian 20 plusers, uh, sisters, they want me to go and do this thing. Sure, honey. I'll see you later. <laughs> you know, this is what you find out about beautiful women is they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I did go and uh, we had a great time. And if you're ever real bored, go on uh, Mona Lisa twins, uh, uh, YouTube Mona Lisa twins and look up waiting for the waiter, which was <laughs> tune they wrote. They, took me to a 300 year old bar that has its own story. And I could take up the entire hour just explaining that, that, that just why this bar is called the fisherman's rest. It's not a happy tale. Essentially, it was an enormous storm that killed all but seven people off of two ships and two rescue uh, uh, boats. Everybody dies except seven people. So when you go into the bar, you're the idiot who goes, gee, what are those seven brass mermaids for? And of course, you find out those are the folks that lived. Mm. So, uh, so the twins, I, I used them relentlessly because when they offered to pay me for these various jobs, I said, whoa, don't, because I'm going to find a reason <laughs> to use you guys 
as background singing. And they loved, they loved that idea. And uh, that is how that uh, came about, that I was able to draft them for those various songs. And it, they make a great appearance on the album. And I wanted to ask about in particular, because this is a song I wondered about for a long time, they can hear this version on this album. Did you ever have to make up your mind is the title. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I'm very curious. Have you ever had that kind of quandary that's talked about in that song where I'm sure a lot of people out there watching or listening to this, uh, they're all of a sudden they have two objects of affection in their life or potential objects of affection and they have to make up their mind. Am I going to go this way or that way? Yes. Well, uh, no, that, that was real. I'm indebted to uh, the Robinson sisters who I've since talked to and who since gave me a very severe talking to uh, <laughs> about this subject. Uh, but I luckily, uh, you know, uh, I was a counselor at a summer camp for five summers. And during that time, you know, you, you, you have friends, friendships. Uh, I mean, nobody, nobody got pregnant. Nobody, nobody ever went that far. It was still summer camp. And, uh, but, but uh, it, it was nonetheless uh, a, a situation where, Occasionally, you would find yourself uh, falling for more than one sister. <laughs> so the song is based on, on reality. Yes. <laughs> well, one of the songs that you do on this, this album, John Sebastian and Arlen Roth explore the Spoonful, Spoonful songbook. Uh, this is a song that I have noticed many, many singers identify with this song. I'm talking about stories we could tell. It's been done by B.J. Thomas, Jimmy Buffett, the Everly Brothers, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, probably other people. Why do Boy, you... you know, that's more people than I knew about. That's interesting. Yeah? You know, they don't, they don't automatically send you a little three-by-five card letting you know. Yeah, a, a lot of singers. got done by John and June, you know. <laughs> Why do you think that so many singers, such a diversity of different types of acts, why do you think that they have identified with that song? Well, maybe we can attribute some of it to its original origins, which were, uh, there was a moment when Paul Rothschild, the wonderful producer, came to me and said, I just got the job of recording the Everly Brothers. And uh, I'm trying to sort of slide them into this project because they've had very tough, uh, you know, interrelationships that have gone wrong and, and uh, you know, that things that make people inordinately angry and then this had all happened and now here they were going to be in the same position again so what he, his idea was i ain't gonna let it happen the same way i'm not even gonna go in a studio john i want to record at your house now i i don't know Catherine and i were going the Everly Brothers are going to record in our living room. That's exactly what happened. And it didn't happen for more than three or four tunes that we did that way. And then by that time, Rothschild, he had cooled it out enough that he could then bring them back into the studio. And man, I had the experience of having Phil and Don, and I'm playing the guitar. Hmm. And uh, I, I just kind of had one of those take me now, Lord, moments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Would you say that that uh, of the different artists who have interpreted stories we could tell, was that your favorite of that one? Interpretation? Boy, you know, that was a really good one. I, I, Johnny and June just kind of take it out to another level for me that uh, their version of, uh, of, um, of, of, um, it wasn't stories we could tell, was it? She says, a flossy mare like you should have a steed. A little bridling down with me is what you need. That's dumb. Was it Darlin' Companion? Yeah. Okay. That was a knockout for you. Yeah, to me, that to me, first of all, Johnny Cash hearing I I I learned so much from I Walk the Line. This may seem silly, but uh, listening to Luther Perkins and listening to what happened on I Walk the Line, which was it changes key every verse. It goes to the subdominant chord and makes the subdominant chord become the tonic chord. And that was somehow a lightning bolt moment for me to understand the way that Chords can be one thing here and then another thing there. It was really, really important. And I, I probably learned more from that one song with three chords than, uh, than I, uh, I learned from any other single song. Well, you have had some really, really interesting. The, the last time we did an interview, we talked about Art Garfunkel doing uh his great version of daydream oh, he did such a good version yeah that's absolutely yeah and then bruce hornsby did a killer version of darlin be home soon did you hear that i don't think i've ever heard that yeah there's pe people boy, have gone crazy with well. their so what's that i said boy he could do that well i yeah. just I heard it but just thinking about it yeah it's one to look up it's 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 really good well what about on this album i know it's hard for a, a recording artist to pick favorites but on this ex exploration of the spoonful songbook is there a real favorite of yours you know i i have to say that my real favorite started off as an instrumental Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a tune that had lots of repeats in it. So I was using the harmonica to, to do all these repeats. And then Arlen calls me up and says, you know, Lexi heard what we're doing here. That's his daughter, a singer. And uh, she'd like to uh, take a crack at it. I said, Okay. She does a vocal out in California. They send it back to me. The minute I heard it, I started erasing all of these harmonica parts and getting rid of the instrumental approach to didn't want to have to do it. And to me, uh, I, I, I don't know if I have anything that's more of a favorite than uh, the way Lexi approached that. When you think about your entirety of your recording work, the solo stuff you've done, this new album, uh, you know, the Love and Spoonful stuff, how do you, what do you think of your work when you look at it as a complete body, as a whole? Good time music. Good time music. That, that's a label that uh, a few people have put on you, but you you run with it. I run with it. <laughs> it's that's it's a pr pretty good description. You know, it all came out of that jug band ethos <laughs> <laughs> well, of like starting a song that sounds like it's going to be all funny, and you realize, 
hey, there's a little sadness in here hidden under under the covers, you know. That that was something I always, uh, st- uh, I did strive to imitate. You know, I was saying at the beginning, uh, of all the concerts I've seen, when I think about great shows that I've seen, I think about seeing Simon and Garfunkel. I think about uh, just different acts. Sean Lennon was a great show. But the show that I saw of you, you were all by yourself, just a solo show. It's one of my favorite live music experiences that I ever had. I did, love that. It, yeah, I was buzzing for weeks. I'm How did you? Way. What's that? I'm delighted. I just said. I speak the truth. How did you learn to be an entertainer? Okay. Rather than go through, you know, this club and that club and so on, I'll tell you a two-minute thing that happened when I was about six that I think is completely why I've always been so comfortable on stage. What happened was my mother was uh, writing humor for Vivian Vance, who was just like her bosom buddy, just they were the Midwestern gals who came to New York at the same time fell in love with Italians and ended up living in Italy and all kinds of stuff. That was, uh, that was their, their background. Uh, And Vivian uh, had a, a a stage show that she could do. Uh, She did a lot of that kind of work. And um, this particular evening, I was along because there was a moment when I was, you know, I was like the, the kid raised in the actor's trunk. Uh, I I was around for a lot of that putting together shows and putting together humor and stuff, just sort of, you know, I'm playing with a toy or something. The show is a smashing success. Viv goes out, takes a bow. The audience goes bananas. The curtains close, and I'm watching this, and I'm 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 side of the stage, and I'm clapping like crazy. She goes like this. Now, I'm as good a second a substitute for a son for for her. She never had children that that. Uh, that there could be. I mean, she, so she gestures to me and, okay, and takes my hand. Now we're in front of the curtain, the curtain's closed. She says, okay, when the curtain opens, the people are going to scream, but they're not mad. They're not mad. Okay, you got it? <laughs> that was all. And I went, okay. Oh, and then and then she oh no, I, 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 she somehow had had said to bow when oh, when uh, she somehow gave me those instructions. Cam, uh, so the the curtain opens. She's right. The camera, uh, the, the the crowd goes nuts now, uh, and it's just because it's a little kid on stage, and you know she knew that it would be that way. And uh, in that moment, I gained a comfort that I don't know if I could have ever gotten, even if it was at a slightly older age. I don't know. She gave me that comfort to say, you, you belong here. Come on, come right here, up in one. If. Great story. Great. And they're, you're right. They're, they're not mad. They are not mad when you come out on stage. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> <They're not mad. laughs> 
this came from a, 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 a listener of ours, Brian Husker, who says he's originally from. Two seconds. I got to let my dog in here. No problem. Yes. Zippy puppy. Come on in here. Ah, the girl. I don't know how it is around you, but we're at single digits uh, these days up in Woodstock. So it's, it's, it's chilly. You got to keep those dogs <laughs> circulating. What's the dog's name? Oh, uh, well, I got two. Dude. I got uh, Sippy Wallace uh, is the uh, small one. And then I've got a kind of uh, fluffy one whose name is Bo. And Bo is the white dog. Bo is the white dog. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I had a white dog named Bo many years ago. Really? Yeah. Huh? A, 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 a Spitz. Yes, I've had a Spitz. <laughs> dogs are wonderful. They, they, uh, their dogs are wonderful. But Spitzes have a certain quality to them. They're, they're, they're very, very specific what they want done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good observation. So this comes from Brian Hosker, who is originally from Boston. Yeah. And he wrote in and he just said, let him know plenty of people still believe in magic. And I thought that was great. But then he said, so much has been said in recent times about bands breaking up or members of bands leaving because of the, the Beatles film. So Brian wants to know if it was a hard decision to leave the Love and Spoonfuls or if you have any memories from from leaving. Oh, a absolutely. I mean, that was the biggest thing in my life, and it did require some very serious thought. But uh, as Zalman Yanovsky had, had really kind of lost his inspiration after getting falsely accused of getting but of 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 uh thinking on somebody it's that's a whole story in itself um that makes me forget everything i was going to say um where were we oh we we're just talking about you know w was it a hard decision to yes yes yeah uh, uh and so really it, it, it was pretty straightforward, was that I could see that the Spoonful couldn't move forward because Zalman was now unhappy enough with his job that it wasn't going to be the same and uh, that, uh, you know, his alcohol use was going to increase. And there were just three or four things that I saw headed right down the pike at me. And, and uh, there was another factor which was that all this time I'd been working with Paul Rothschild and with a, a number of uh, reprobates, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and all these guys. And that was a kind of a, a, a new focus for me. And it made me think, gee, I'd kind of like to make an album where I could pick the musician for each two. And I really explored these four people are who we're making everything with. And that's the difference between us and a lot of the people we're grouped with is that, you know, we were, no, we weren't using Hal Blaine. Uh, you know, it was another, was another approach of what we were doing. And uh, so that, uh, that, that was the that was the way that uh, that I was approaching this new idea, and uh, Paul Rothschild was w wonderfully supportive and saying, "Yeah, you know, like a song like she's a lady, we can bring in like a baroque." instrument or two and you know who do we get oh yeah there's uh we know gail somebody who plays the harp and her husband who plays the uh, uh, viola da gamba and you know so we were uh, excited by the idea of, of that exploration so it it was a pretty straightforward decision mm. 
Well, this question, I, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. It's either Jean Eden or uh, John Eden. John Eden. He wants to know from John Sebastian, what makes a great singer? Isn't that an interesting thing? Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, because you, you, you think of somebody who has a good voice, you know, that's one level. But then you get into Richie Havens, mm-hmm. you know, like somebody like that. Uh, I remember the first time I heard him in Washington Square singing doo-wop with a, his group from Brooklyn. That, that, that's what he was doing at the time. He hadn't picked up a guitar. He hadn't met Freddie Neal yet, who was going to say, you should be playing music and singing and go do that. Hmm. That's interesting. One of the people that you've worked with, I'm curious to know, do you think Bob Dylan is a great singer. Oh, yeah, I do. I do. And and I'll even go further. I think he's a great harmonica player. (laughs) And I was so upset with the fact that, see, we were kind of harmonica players together in the basement of Gertie's Folk City. Nobody can get arrested. You know, it's like really before anything has happened except just a little bit of a rumble of, of what Dylan was going to be able to do. But Belafonte is calling him to do these harmonica things. And I go, look, the guy's a genius songwriter. You got it. He sings his own way. It's great. The harmonica, come on. My dad is the greatest harmonica player that's ever lived. You're not going to be able to convince me that this is all that marvelous. But I tell you, it grows on you. Mm. The kind of inhale, exhale, repeat. You know, it was kind of cool. When was the last time you saw Dylan? Boy, it's a long time ago. It's it, it is a it, it's quite a long time ago. And and I don't think we've really, you know, spoken or had a conversation since sometime in the late 60s. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when somebody is listening to this album, John Sebastian and Arlen Roth explored the Spoonful songbook. What do you want the listener to get from that experience? I want them to have the feeling of me and Arlen sitting in their living room. This isn't me and Arlen on a huge pedestal with uh, with uh, flashing lights and and uh, and girls dancing in the background. You know, this is just two lonely guys. And luckily, we had Ira Coleman and Eric Parker as uh, as uh, support to to you know make the album as rhythmic as we wanted it to be. Uh, but that that was it. And you think that there might be a second album like this? Oh, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't discount that idea at all. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that you know the COVID situation does have us kind of nailed into our various uh, winter abodes. But uh, you know, summer's going to come. Me and Arlen are going to be sitting on the porch again, and no telling what might come out of that. <laughs> well, that gives us something to look forward to. Oh, that's nice. Well, John Sebastian, I'm thrilled to get the chance, the chance to talk to you yet again. Uh, it was one of the highlights of, of being on the radio when I did that interview and, and to have a second shot. Oh, that's my clear. That's, that's awesome. So everybody out there, check out johnbsebastian.com. And please check out this record where John Sebastian and Arlen Roth explore the Spoonful Songbook. Thank you, Larry. (laughs) Well, thank you very much. And I hope we get a chance to talk again sometime. I do, too. (laughs) All right, sir. So long till next time. Till next time. You know, the Paul Leslie Hour is made possible by people like you, listeners, viewers. Please 
go to thepaulleslie.com slash support, and you'll know what to do when you're there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who contributes. Video editing today by Kumar. Performance of The Entertainer intro song by John Primerano. And of course, this is your announcer speaking. See you next time on the Paul Leslie Hour.